Hey friends, welcome back to a, another book video. We are expanding what we talk about on this channel. If you've watched um, my recent fashion video, I really enjoyed making that. Thank you so much for the comments as well and the messages on Instagram. I really appreciate it, but no fear, books will remain um, an integral part of uh, the content that I make on here. So that being said, I'm going to wrap up everything I read in October. I know I missed my September wrap up and part of me is like, I have to do that because I cannot have a missed month but then the more overriding part of me is like it's been so long I can't be fucked and I think the books I loved the most in September I did post about on Instagram and um in like various reading videos so I don't feel so bad about that and honestly yeah I don't know it's been it's been too long to talk about them now I think um but in October I read 15 books I continued my reading streak and had such a good reading months so I'm going to talk to you about all of these apologies if they are lengthy so I'm just going to start with the books I um don't have to show you and then I'll get on with the stack that I do have to show you okay so on on on, bleh, on audio I listened to burning my roti breaking barriers as a queer Indian woman I think I made a video when I read this this is a memoir and um a series of interviews talking about life as a British Indian woman. The author um, Sharon talks about her experiences growing up in South London in a predominantly Indian community and sort of her experiences and her family's experiences of living um, in like a predominantly brown community but in a predominantly white country and is talking a lot about the experiences of racism, xenophobia and um, the trauma that she underwent being... Um, both within her own community as being someone who was discovering their sexuality, who was talking openly about those things, as well as the experiences her community had um, as, as a minority group in the capital. So it's a really interesting blend of personal memoir and um, advice to younger people and sociological analysis. So um, Sharon's talking about her upbringing, things like related to her hair, body hair, her sexuality, her first sexual experiences and um, relating that back to how her family, her like the wider community and stuff um, spoke about the way she chose to live her life and how there is some damaging rhetoric within her own community about very patriarchal views of women and their roles and autonomy and things like that but then she also interviews other people sort of bringing in experts and other South Asian women to talk about and converse with different elements of her story. So Burning My Roti is actually a name of the magazine that she ran that was the precursor to this book. And I think a lot of the relationships and maybe even some of the interviews she had were built prior to writing it, but like through the magazine. Um, so she talks to other magazine editors, she talks to artists, to creators, to um, therapists, all different people who are... Um, who share an identity with her and also an expertise in an area that she's interested in. And I really liked that blending of personal and more sociological. I thought that brought um, an extra added interest to the book and provided some background to a lot of the personal experiences she was having. And I think that the way she talks about particularly sex and sexuality is um, taboo breaking, I guess, and a necessary part of... Um, breaking down some of those barriers that she feels she has in her culture as well as like the wider questions about the way we police women women's bodies and women's sexuality and I think she does a really good job at balancing those things and like she said in the introduction of the book she wants this book to be for also younger South Asian women who are coming to terms with their identity and their um, balancing of those two things modernity and um, traditional culture and family values and I think she does that really well it's a very um, funny and light-hearted in places but bringing to light some serious topics that she feels like are um, underwritten in her community and I think it was really well done so would recommend listening to that one I listened to it on Scribd I think and then a book I read at the same time as listening to this was An Unrestored Woman this is a series of short stories written in and around the partition so it talks about the immediate aftermath of English colonialism in India and focuses on different communities and villages um, along sort of the border between India and Pakistan that was formed in 1949 I want to say my Indian history is 
limited at best. But I really enjoyed the way that this book dealt with, um, again, with women's experiences, with centering the voices of women, homemakers, um, sex workers, wives, daughters, and those conversations around um, culture and femininity within the communities that they were focusing on. It had a really strong geography to these stories which I enjoyed they are interconnected so characters reappear that may have been the feature of one character study will come across as a background as an auntie as a brothel owner as a passerby and I loved I love those kinds of short story collections where you really get to sort of play where's Wally with the characters and find out um who fits into this like jigsaw puzzle that um Rao is creating so there's 12 stories in here Oh, my mistake, the formation of India and Pakistan is 1947 era, two years off there. But it talks a lot about migration, about mass displacement. And one of the stories that stuck in my mind so much is about a cartographer and him drawing the border, um, like physically going out to enact the border and the way that his personal life and his love life and his the things he's been told from his boss impact like such a life changing um physical and metaphorical border that is built and it's definitely a book that builds the case for abolition of the nation state and the um imperfect nature of borders so I think it did that really well and it talks a lot about um class within India and Pakistan and the different systems of oppression that affect women, domestic workers, sex workers, those kinds of conversations. And I liked the way she dealt with tension um, between classes. And yeah, there's a few stories featuring domestic workers, which I think is um, like pertinent at the time and continues to be pertinent when we talk about the ethics and the care of people in um, other countries. So I thought that that was really well done. And obviously is a story of the impact of colonialism and the horrors of English rule in multiple countries in the world and in this case across in India so I thought it was really beautifully written and the stories were easy to read but I liked that like I say that character study that spotting the other characters and I liked its focus on women so would definitely recommend that short story collection I think it came out a while ago and I picked it up really on a whim but I enjoyed it then I listened to Selma Blair's Mean Baby this is a memoir that had been on my radar for a while Selma Blair is an actress I think she's best known for Star Wars. Someone in the comments is going to be like, shut up, it's actually Star Trek or something. I'm not a Star Wars or fantasy movie person, but I think that is where she made her biggest name. But she also was in a lot of 90s films um, and more recently has become an ambassador for MS, multiple sclerosis, and went on Dancing with the Stars or Dancing with Ice, like the American equivalent of Street to Come Dancing, basically, and was featured on then got a lot of conversations going about disability and um, physical activity. So the memoir Mean Baby, the byline is a memoir of growing up and Mean Baby is the nickname that sort of her mum gave her as a insolent, petulant child, a, um, a, a, a like a naysayer in the family, someone always up to no good. And she tells really funny and vivacious stories about her upbringing. Um, she talks a lot about her Jewish identity and within that her um, connection to the culture that her mother was raised in. And there's a really interesting conversations about um, cultural identity and mother daughter relationships, which I really enjoyed. I think um, Selma Blair is at her best here when she's writing about those really personal stories and reflecting on those like, you know, mundane moments of childhood. I do love to read about other people's childhoods, particularly um, in the context like that's so different to my own upbringing. I think she does that really well. She talks about sort of um, her mum's experience of her celebrityness later in life and sort of her mum's uh, disregard for what she did as a job like as acting as sort of a reasonable career path and talks about that in relation to her mother's cultural upbringing which I enjoyed I didn't wouldn't say I love this as much as I was hoping to um I'm not sure why like something didn't necessarily click between me and um, Blair's writing which I think is always difficult when it comes to memoir um I think it is interesting the way she traces back I guess, parts of her medical history and reflects on the ways that she was perhaps disregarded for random symptoms of illness throughout her life. And, um, you know, even now that they're building a huge body of research about MS and the way that it um, manifests in bodies and develops in later life. Last summer, I was in a ward with a young man who was a chef um, who had 
received an MS diagnosis and there's a lot of conversations about how um, sort of external factors like toxins and environments impact people's um, illnesses like MS and she talks sort of about becoming a like unintentionally becoming such an ambassador for the illness and the way that illness impacts her life isn't wholeheartedly about that which I didn't expect given the title's Mean Baby I knew it was going to be a lot about her childhood but um the bits that she did put in about illness particularly there's a story about how she was in her early 20s and experiencing a lot of random symptoms and pain and and an eye doctor an op optroman I don't know what you call an eye doctor um said that there was a particular feature in her eye that is an early marker for MS and it was completely disregarded by her doctors and also by herself and later it came to like that that is what um she had but I thought yeah something about it wasn't wholeheartedly like a five star for me but um I had an, an enjoyable experience listening to it and then I also listened to A Mind Spread Out on the Ground by Alicia Elliott I spoke about this in a what I read this week video this is a memoir of a First Nations woman living in Canada talking about her experience of racism, the legacy of oppression and the violence towards Indigenous and First Nations people in Canada. Um, definitely a topic I'm interested in. I'm reading another book about that right now and it's um, talking a lot about particularly intergenerational trauma and mental ill health growing up in a family with parents who experience different mental illness and are struggling within the confines of oppressive structures because of their native background. So she grew up with a Christian or Catholic mum, I think, and then a dad who was um, First Nations. So she spent some time living on a reserve. She had like extended family um, who were part of the reserve community and then also split her time with her maternal grandma who was religious um so that sort of juxtaposition was really interesting to read about it's a lot about poverty and sort of forced poverty upon first nations um families and alicia Ell elliott is reflecting on her own raising her own child um differently i guess and appreciating the circumstances the good circumstances that she finds herself in but at the same time always having to live with the um the experience of the trauma she had as a child as well as the trauma that her you know her collective community has been through so she talks about sort of being on a holiday with her her um kid and her husband and they're having a great time I think she works in a university setting now and then there's a story appears on the news of um a First Nations woman no um like young boy who's murdered by the police and by like white Canadian farmers and she talks about how sort of the very visceral reaction she had to that and how you have to constantly cope with those kinds of um that kind of trauma that comes from external sources um which I thought was really um well done and you know eye-opening for um the state of Canada and the way it deals with um has like such a huge problem with police violence against indigenous bodies which I guess is less so talked about particularly like as you get further away from Canada like of course it's being spoken about within Canada but as someone living in Europe and England like you definitely the news is predominantly focused on um the violence against uh, black men and boys in America which obviously of course is also a huge issue but um yeah I, I thought the way she talked about that kind of trauma and pol the police state in Canada was particularly notable um there's stuff in here about sexual violence and poverty like I say and sort of the way that her schooling and her upbringing and the adults outside of her family like CPS and school teachers were ill-equipped to deal with poverty and the way that she was shamed for things like having head lice and being um poorly dressed and being cold and not having lunch and like things like that and the yeah the way that that was completely mishandled within the public school system and there is some comments about um sort of the modern look at Canadian literature there's a book I read a few years ago called before I was a critic, I was a human. It's one of my favourite, like, random niche nonfiction books I've ever read. And it's about the Canadian art scene in relation to First Nations art and creativity and um, also mental health. And this book reminded me slightly of that in the way that she talks about the refusal for Canada's literary community at large to take on Indigenous and First Nations stories with enough 
like gusto that they should be read with so would highly highly recommend that one on audio audio book i rest listen to i was big on audio this month i'm sure i can't remember why probably just in bed and stuff um i read or listened to becoming a man a story of transition by p carl so this is a memoir of sort of later life transition and coming to terms with your gender identity so um P. Carl begins his gender transition I think uh, like in his middle age around 50 and he previously was um in a marriage and was building a life like with an entirely different identity although he was always under like knew that he wanted to transition so it's about his personal experience but it's very much one of those like personal is political books talking about cultural commentary and making um like wider statements about the state of gender identity in the states and the way that we talk about gender and power he starts to transition during like trump era politics and is um, referencing a lot of the sort of like the nation state and the way that the world feels to be so dangerous as a trans man at the time and is also gives some really interesting insight and uh, thoughtful commentary to the aftermath of Me Too um, in relation to um, trans community and I thought that was really interesting and he talks also a lot about masculinity, toxic masculinity, sort of um, the desire to transition at the same time to confront some of the most toxic and ill-informed types of masculinity that we see and I thought that was really interesting it's about a lot about friendship about like enduring long life friendship and adapting with friendship when you have these huge life changes like a transition I thought all of that was really beautiful the way he talks about friends um losing people he loves and also building that community after transition and I really enjoyed this he comments on his relationship to his family particularly they have quite like a tumultuous and up and down relationship and how that interacted with both his transition and his um sort of his life before as well and it paints a bit of a memoir picture there but yeah it was it was a lot about non-nuclear family and friendship and loss in those all of those relationships in life but also like the joy of um yeah enduring friendship so would highly recommend that one then on audio i listened to somebody loves you by mona Arshi. i spoke about this i think also in a video this is a set of vignettes a very plotless story about a young british indian girl who has selective mutism and it's about her upbringing her family life her mother is mentally unwell and sort of it's a lot about clashing needs and um yeah sort of like complicated home life um selective mutism isn't a topic that is like widely written about i would say in literature this is definitely like a literary fiction book um Mona Ashi is a poet by trade, so it does have a very lyrical quality to it. And I really enjoyed that juxtaposition between the selective mutism. I um, have taught a couple of children when I used to be a teacher with selective mutism. And I think, um, yeah, the way this was portrayed, I think was very delicate and like beautifully written. It definitely isn't a um, straight linear narrative. I think it would frustrate a lot of people, but I definitely think it's well suited to the audio format, which is why I think I enjoyed it so much. Um, it's very playful and beautiful. It's about two sisters, mostly like the parents are there and there is um, some stuff, like I say, about mental illness and her mother and the pressures of sort of um, white picket fence suburbia. But the like the crux of the stories are all about this this friendship between her and her sister and sort of her one other friend and I really liked that that trio of voices that we heard from and I think it says a lot about yeah like language silence um societal expectations of children the issues with our education system when it comes to children who aren't progressing in a way that we see as like normal or like age milestone appropriate um and I think um what it said about yeah language and children was really well done I think it's an underrated book I also love the cover of this I think it's beautiful and I would love a copy on my shelf um another audiobook I listened to we're doing all audio first is The Appointment by Katharina Volkmer this is a very controversial I think um German book about a woman who visits a psychiatrist well, so we believe and it's sort of like a two and a half hour three hour monologue on audio of her talking about 
her personal history, her experiences with gender dysphoria and her desire to inhabit other bodies, at the same time talking about the history of Germany, particularly in relation to Nazism, Hitler. Um, and yeah, it's a very odd book. And I spoke to one of my German friends about it who hasn't read it, but has read a lot of the like surrounding controversy and conversation around it. They're an English lecturer and... Um, I think I perhaps I did intrigue her enough that she'll go away and read it and we can have further conversation about it. Um, but I thought it was, I really enjoyed listening to it. I think it was quite interesting and the monologue format really suits audio. I felt like I was being bombarded by this story. I know there's a lot of conversation about it being distasteful or sort of crossing the line of what's acceptable to add humour to. Um, and when I was talking to my friend about it, she said that she felt like, as a German person, that that was quite a standard response, I suppose. Um, whereas I feel like English humour or British humour or our... The, the way that we... Like, our culture of humour is very different and I didn't necessarily find this... Like, I didn't personally find it too far. But again, I'm not German or Jewish or any of the identities that are being discussed in the book but I didn't find it in bad taste and I don't think from I read like extensively reviews and comments online and I think on the whole there isn't like many well-grounded reviews that were outrightly offended by it you know people could find merit and discussion around it and obviously the author is German themselves so for them to talk about those things is, you know, personal preference. So definitely an intriguing one. Um, one I would recommend if you think it sounds interesting to you. I think what it was saying about cultural history and silence and the inability to speak about the unspeakable was um, notable. And for that, I enjoyed it just to have that as a takeaway and something to chew over. So that's the appointment. Then I listened to Lost Found Remembered by Lyra McKee, McGee, McKee which I also spoke about in a recent video. This is a collection of essays by the late Lyra McKee, who was an Irish journalist who was murdered in 2018, I think, quite recently, um, for her work of investigative journalism and coverage of the Troubles. So these essays are split up into different categories, talking about the Troubles, her research, her... Um, a large chunk of it is a book that was never published about what she determines the Lost Boys, who are the ceasefire generation of young boys and men who took their own lives following the economic crash, intergenerational trauma and sort of the state of Northern Ireland at the time post um, post the Good Friday Agreement. And I think all of that was, um, yeah, super interesting and obviously like tragic to know that Lyra was so young. Before, like, her life was taken, and there's a particular essay in here where she talks about her fear of being killed um, for her work and sort of how every time she leaves her house she thinks it might be the last. And obviously to listen to that on audio knowing that she's no longer alive is extremely harrowing. But I thought, um, on the whole, I re referenced in the video that I had a few um, nitpicky points about the way she talked particularly about Israel and Palestine which if you want to hear about that you can watch it in the video but on the whole I would recommend it as a read it's a really important book and a really um, interesting collection of essays particularly if you're a writer or a journalist or just someone who wants to be well informed on um, sort of post Good Friday Northern Ireland and then I have one book that I read did I only read one book on my e-reader that is um, impressive for me. Oh no, I read the short story collection on there. Then I read the latest novel by Derek Owusu called Losing the Plot. I think this is out by the time you watch this, but I had an early copy of it. I love Derek Owusu, his first, um, his debut book, which I don't, I'm looking at my shelves like, where is it? But I think I lent it to a friend in London. He is one of my favourite books of all time. I think he's such a brilliant writer and a poet. He lives with BPD and his first book focuses on his experience like semi-autobiographical of um, growing up in the care system, foster care, and later his like diagnosis and experience with BPD as a young black man. But Losing the Plot is a fictionalised memoir slash account of his mother's migration to London from Ghana. And it is a very lyrical and um explosive story I would say about um those early years of 
um, migration for the mother in this story. It talks about sort of struggle and hardship in terms of economics, job, finding a home. It's focused a lot in Tottenham, which is also where Awusu grew up and uh, relationship to God and finding community within church and then also raising a son, which is obviously Derek. Um, the book is, yeah, like I say, very metaphorical and um, playful in its prose, like almost in a Max Porter type of way. But the um, the chapters are sort of footnoted quite um, like quite a lot. There's quite big footnotes, which are in this really confessional and chatty tone from Awusu, which I really enjoyed, where he's often translating a piece of, is it Tui? Like um, Ghanaian language and explaining to the reader sort of etiquette referring to the way like the certain things that his family did or the way that his mum disciplined him or the way he behaved and sort of their relationship and commenting like reflecting in real time on sort of yeah the events of his childhood or of the childhood in this book um, and then the final chapter is a transcription of an interview he has with his mum talking about um are trying to tease out the 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 um plot of the book essentially before he writes the book so i guess it's almost like a prologue trying to establish her journey the facts how she felt what it was like why she went to church how why she decided to move and it, um her his mother's very evasive and funny and closed off and i don't know i feel like that interview transcript said so much more even more so than the entire book in itself and i loved reading it so much i think he's such a gift like he writes with such vigor and joy about things that are so hard and yeah i don't know like his writing just really does it for me it's definitely experimental it's definitely opaque in places but i think um that is all to its credit if you stick with his books they are often very short but um the kind of book you need to reread line by line and i really really love this one and i look forward to reading like everything else he ever writes i think he's just brilliant Okay, that is all of the digital things I have to talk to you about. So this is going to be a long video. Um, I read Night Bitch by Rachel Yoda. I read this for my paperback Amsterdam book club, which is just a book club I run with some Amsterdam fellow dwellers. And this was our pick for October. We like, read it in September and October. So I'm sure lots of people have already heard about this book. Essentially, it is a literary fiction book about a young mother who believes she's turning into a dog. This was a lot funnier than I was expecting, and I give it credit for that, although I wasn't wholly convinced by the plot line. But take that with a grain of salt, because I'm not always that invested in these kinds of fantastical stories. I've read a lot of like deranged women books or mothers on the edge type book so perhaps the like fad is is fading for me in that sense but I, it was a lot funnier than I thought and I really enjoyed there's the um the dad character who like goes away for work and has this very like happy clappy pop side version of mental health that he wants to push on his wife and I thought like the the jibs at that at the like industrial mental health complex kind of stuff was really funny and interesting and smart um and I really liked the way Yoda played with those sort of live, laugh, love kind of versions of mental health. Um, and I did find it compelling to read. I will say that like the chapters are short and the storyline keeps moving um, in a way that you want to find out. And it does um, sort of get quite deranged. But um, and I loved the like, there's like a subplot about like a semi like MLM essential oil like cult vibe which I obviously really enjoyed as well and sort of the cult of motherhood I guess is a big um theme within the book but I wouldn't say it was like um a favorite favorite of mine I know it's being made into a movie with Amy Adams which my friend Kylie is really upset about she doesn't like Amy Adams nor do I really but I think I will watch the movie it's definitely the kind of book that you can see translated onto the screen and feels like um almost a book written as a precursor to a movie if that makes sense so that was night bit then i read year of the tiger by alice wong again i vlogged about it look how many uh fold down flaps and underlines i have done of this one so this is a memoir of alice wong she is a formidable disability activist writer force for good she edited disability visibility which is the namesake of also her um website disability visibility project um she does a lot of work on anti-ableism accessibility digital culture she's just brilliant and this is a book of both her life her work 
her relationships, her experiences. It's laid out in a very um, novel format. It has illustrations and a lot of photos and then transcripts from podcasts that she's previously been on or conversations she's had with friends. Um, it has collages and it really blends conversations about the present particularly relating to covid um isolation inaccessibility as well as her childhood her upbringing her parents um her siblings and i really loved particularly those chapters on her early life on her relationship to her chinese heritage um on making food there's so much in here about food and the joy of eating and the way that alice as her um health continues to impact the way she can nourish herself um i don't know there's just so much joy and like life-giving energy in the way she talks about food and it's yeah i just really loved that bit of it for so many reasons and i think it would be sort of unintentionally a really good balm for anyone who's dealing with um food related issues anxieties disordered eating like i really think the way she talks about food is so yeah, just like life-giving and beautiful. And I think the format of this book is so inventive. Oh, look at baby Alice. And um, really expands the way we talk about memoir and this like scrapbook of her life. I cannot recommend this enough. It's only out in the States as far, as far as I'm aware. I had to buy it from um, online. So if you are looking for it, I don't think it's like super readily available, but perhaps ask in your local indie if they can order it for you. Then I read a poetry collection that my friend Monica edited. This is Chronicles, an anthology. It's out with Blood Moon Poetry, edited, edited like I said, by my friend Monica and um, has an intro by Lucia Osborne Crowley, another brilliant, sick writer that I love. And it's, as the title suggests, a collection of poems about chronic illness featuring mostly about women's pain. Um, there's a lot of poems in here about endometriosis, about fibromyalgia, about medical gaslighting dismissal and obviously it's an anthology so it has a range of voices and a range of poems like structurally and form wise that might or might not be your cup of tea i posted some extracts on my instagram if you're interested and if you want to support an indie publishing house then definitely take a look at that one speaking of indie i also read on not knowing by emily ogden how to love and other essays out with press peninsula this is a slim but pretty dense set of essays about um about the idea of not necessarily fence sitting but being comfortable with not knowing everything whether that's everything about a topic everything about your future life everything about your work and it's like a a very generative um idea that Ogden is working with here it's like opening up the space to not know and I really enjoy the way she deals with that topic so each essay is titled sort of let me get the page thing for you um, as how to's, how to swim, how to hold it together, how to milk, how to riff, how to listen, how to love, how to hope, how to stay. And I think there's so much in here that is, um, like I say, generative, that's thoughtful and inspecting things that are usually taken as status quo. I think the way she writes about motherhood in here, and particularly child, like rearing children in the present is so, so beautiful and yeah I just love this it's so so smart if you're interested in sort of like an academic toned collection of essays dealing with like the small mundane parts of life then I think you would find this interesting she references a lot of mythology of ancient history um to bring forward her topics and yeah really really love this one then I read I'm a fan by Sheena Patel this is a sort of I don't want to say it it feels um auto fiction but i won't credit it with that because i don't know if it is but it follows a narrator who is having i wouldn't necessarily say an affair but she's basically in a relationship and being unfaithful with another man who is a prolific like you know love rat sort of cheater kind of person so it has this very unequal unnerving tone to the way she talks about love it's definitely about modern love about relationships about infidelity and it's written in quite a comical tone in places but that's levied with some really serious and important conversations around race around um misogynoir around the way that um men treat women particularly brown women and the way that we 
fail to hold each other to account, I guess. I think this is a very um, thoughtful read, although on the surface, I think. Like, you, it's one of those books you could read it in multiple different layers, and I think if I um, sat with it longer, I would have got even more out of it than I did. But I definitely recommend it. It's, it, it's a lot about, yeah, sex and rage and dating and... I guess really it's about power it's about the dynamics that we have with the people that we love um whether that's friends the people we don't know in terms of like the other woman and those ideas of like the web of people that you affect when you interact with someone it, for example when you cheat or when you love or when you leave someone who that impacts and I think that was really well done and it's a lot about like I say patriarchy and standards and um there's a few interesting things in here also about social media not necessarily unique like things you haven't heard before when it comes to social media but it was written in a non-cringe way which my standards for people writing about social media and novels now is pretty low in terms of like so much of it cringes me out and I think um Sheena Patel in this case managed to tackle it without making me want to scream so scream <laughs> like make me squeamish so I did enjoy that one and I finally finished um, How to Read Now by Elaine Castillo. This is a non-fiction book by one of my favourite authors of all time. If you have not read America is Not the Heart, it's my favourite family saga ever to exist on this planet. And um, this is her collection of essays about reading. I would say perhaps it's slightly mismarketed in that sense because it's less so... It is about reading and particularly the, the, the front end of these essays are... The front end of this book is about sort of critically reading and how we analyse and whiteness within readership and the state of the publishing industry. But I would say a good third to like almost half of this book is cultural critique of television, of movies, of other books um, that are in, in like through the lens of um, white supremacy and race and those conversations, which I did find interesting. But she talks a lot about sort of TV that I've mentioned before. I really don't watch TV like the Marvel Universe and She-Hulk and like those kinds of um, films and TV shows which are so out of my ether of understanding which is fine and I think I will give her credit in the sense that I still enjoy those essays and I am not like normally I will sometimes skim past them if I'm really not interested in the, the topic that she's that um, the writer is talking about but in this case she held my attention enough for me to read past the fact I don't understand the plot of whatever book or novel or tv show she's talking about um and I think the way she talks about art and literature in general is particularly notable there's an essay in here that's like a takedown of sort of the American canon in relation to non-fiction and like with a focus on Joan Didion which I thought was really well done and also some really soft moments of like personal stories and um journey she's been on and sort of how she is the writer that she is now and I loved all of that and I hope there's more of that to come from her in the future so definitely an essential read if you are a reader or if you want to improve your critical reading skills and understand sort of the wider political implications of reading certain books so definitely one to pick up this is obviously a very early proof the actual cover looks like that and then finally perhaps my favorite book I read this um month is Boyfriends by Michael Pedersen. This was sent to me in a box by Porty Books. Porty Books are a really cool independent bookshop up in Edinburgh and they run a really cool subscription book service and they sent it to me earlier in the summer to test out and this was the book from their non-fiction pick and I'm so glad that I got that they offered me that box. Um, Beth there is amazing and this book I don't think would have come onto my radar at least not as quickly um, without having that that box so boyfriends is a book about male friendship it focuses on Penderson's relationship with Scott Hutchinson who was the, the lead singer or drummer in the band Frightened Rabbit which you might know if you were like an indie sleaze gal or guy but um it's less so obviously about his music career but more about their relationship he was also on the side of being a musician was an illustrator and illustrated a lot of Michael's um, poetry collections his cover art and like they had a working relationship in that sense but also you know a deep enduring friendship but Scott Hutchinson tragically took his own life um, after struggling for years with mental illness um, and the book is is about grief and loss of a friend and there's some some beautiful bits in here about the hierarchy of grief about how we're allowed to grieve 
um, the people in our life that we're not related to, how that fits into masculinity. And this book essentially is a is a book about masculinity, about male friendship, without it being sort of, I, I read occasionally articles and excerpts and reviews of books that claim to be about male friendship. And I find them always overall and focusing on statistics and talking about sort of the crisis of um, male friendship. But this book doesn't do that. It just, um, Penderson is so open with his love he has for his friends. Um, and so you have this storyline of his relationship to Hutchinson and their like him dealing in real time with this grief. The book was written like the year after Hutchinson died. So it's, it is very internal and, and in some sense you could say selfish because we don't really hear about Hutchinson and sort of his life. It's more, it's a lot of second person of writing to him of, of Michael Penderson talking about the relationships that, um, or the experiences he's having that he wishes Hutchinson was there for and saying like, I'm doing this for you. Like recalling the last meal they had together the last trip they took together and it's very like self-centered in that sense which like makes sense for the grief that he was dealing with and the turmoil he was in at the time but prior to that experience there is stories of all the friendships he had basically in his early adult life about going to university having a mentor there and he went to Durham and he talks about sort of the transition of coming from a working class part of Scotland and going to Durham which if you don't know is like a very collegiate highbrow university that has a similar system to Oxbridge in terms of like colleges and stuff and he talks about that experience and then all the male friends he's picked up and and had and, and there's a lot in there about friendship breakup and the people that come into your life for a season and don't stick around but um I just think it's so beautifully written without being um like overdone and it's just so he just exposes himself as someone who loves his friends so deeply. And like, that is just so wonderful to read, even in the circumstance of him losing his best friend. And I just, yeah, I just loved it so much. Like, I really can't explain it. I don't think it will be for everyone. There's certainly points where you would laugh or roll your eyes perhaps at him and Scott's sort of like misdemeanors or, you know, sort of jammy things they get away with when they are younger. But I don't know, to read it in the spirit of which he he wrote it, which is so much love for his friend, I think is just beautiful. And it's very full frontal in the way it talks about suicide and mental illness. And I found that really comforting, which I know some people, if you deal with suicidal ideation or if you struggle with your mental health can be like wanting to avoid those topics. But for me, I find it really comforting to confront them and, and think about the way that um, that suicide impacts are whether people outside of yourself and I find that very life affirming in ways so yeah also like an interesting read if you're someone who deals really really struggles with staying alive then I think this is also really beautiful in that sense to know like how much he loved his friend and although that didn't save his friend in the end it's so yeah I just think it's like very affirming in that sense so yeah, that is probably the best book I read this month. And with that, I shall say goodbye because I have been talking for such a long time. Please let me know if you read any of these, if you loved any of these, if you're going to add any of them to your TBR and I'll be back soon with another video. Bye.